Hi everyone, I'm Yun Ludwig Hammer, Grandmaster at Chess and now also a Chessable author. Welcome to my first Chessable course, Hammer's Nimso Indian. The Nimso Indian is one of the most common chess openings and it's also one of the best openings, uh, which is why it's so common. It's a response to d4 when we go with a flexible knight f6, taking some important control in the center of the board. White continues their strategy of using the pawns to control the center, and we uh, open up for the development of our bishop. The Nimso is very much an opening that focuses on quick development and castling early on. After knight c3, we see the white knight trying to gain control of those same squares that we were uh, aiming for with our knight. And we deal with that by putting our bishop into the game, pointing down on that knight, but also towards the white king. The Nimso is much more than an opening. The Nimso is chess. Uh, it is uh, middle games, it's about strategies, about pawn structures, uh, and it's one of the most diverse openings in terms of how many different of these elements uh, you come across. It has amazing attacks and, and great tactics, but it also has very clever um, strategic elements uh, to outplay the opponent. So in this course, um, I'm aiming to show you all the possible variations you will need to know from this starting point. That means in some situations, we're gonna go deep. We're gonna go 20, 25 moves deep to find the, the truth of the position. I'm a grandmaster at chess. I care about objectivity. I care about the objective truth. But that doesn't mean you need necessarily all of that stuff. Uh, this course is aimed at providing everyone with what they need to play the Nimso. That means uh, a lot of explanations for the early moves because the early moves is what's gonna be important for the lower levels. But it also means that um, some of the lines will be irrelevant to many of you because 25 move theory, that's for like 2,400 rated chess players, but it's still there because it's a course for everyone. When I make the course, uh, my level that, that I'm expecting of the moves is that I will be able to play this opening, this repertoire myself. And I'm a 2600 rated grandmaster. I coached Magnus, I helped with his openings for the world championship matches. That's the standard I hold myself to. So I do go very, very deep into some of the variations. Uh, but my hope is that that will help players of all levels uh, use this course. Uh, but it is a fair warning to most of you that probably it's going to be the 10 first moves that are most important for you to learn. And a lot of the stuff that goes very far beyond that is it's for people like me. It's for literal grandmasters. Let's jump into the moves. We have our Nimso Indian starting position. Uh, and in the first chapter, we look at all of the unusual white moves. Most of them are unusual because they're pretty bad. Uh, Queen B3 is like the worst version of the very popular Queen to C2 line. Uh, black can immediately charge in towards the center and this queen is not perfectly placed because it doesn't contribute taking control of that very important e4 square. Uh, we also take a look at the bishop getting involved. Bishop f4 doesn't really put pressure on black and, and allows black to immediately uh, put uh, pressure in towards the white center. Same thing with bishop to g5. This one, at the very least, is more threatening because it points down towards the black queen, 
but still C5 uh, puts the onus back on white. Uh, and if white here goes E3, that's already a decisive mistake with the queen joining the party with threats towards the king, in addition to the knight getting involved, attacking the bishop and towards the white knight as well. Uh, there are uh, one more uh, line here for white in that first chapter, which is like a catalan nimso hybrid going for the fianchetto of the bishop. I make the argument here that black should capture the knight immediately. Essentially, my feeling is that this g3 move is about as useless as the a3 move uh, which is the same as line forcing the bishop to trade for the knight immediately. Uh, and we look at how the, the problems arise with white's doubled pawns. Returning to our initial position, there's also the Kasparov Nimso Indian, knight to f3, a logical developing move. Once again, we go c5, immediately putting pressure in towards the white center. If white tries to support the center, we actually choose here to go bishop takes c3, uh, creating that strategic disadvantage for white with the doubled c pawns. Uh, if white instead goes for the main line of the fianchetto with g3, we just follow the way the Nimso Indian has been played for several decades already. Speaking of that doubled uh, pawn for white, a3, the same-ish variation, is important to cover. But frankly, if this a3 move was good, then the Nimso Indian wouldn't even be an opening. White is provoking the trade, giving white the doubled pawns, and we can try to exploit that. Uh, by uh, going first c5, having some influence in the center. But in the long run, we're going to target with our pieces towards the c4 pawn, uh, which is impossible to guard with white's other pawns. Um, there's a similar, uh, the cousin of this a3 variation is f3 which is also super aggressive, trying to uh, get white's pawns into the center of the board with e4 coming up next. We're going to temporarily prevent that e4 move by pushing our pawn up in the center first. The problem then becomes after a3, the same-ish move from its cousin, here we don't really like capturing on c3. The reasoning is that here, even though white has doubled pawns, white is going to be able to trade one of those pawns against our pawn. And if we try to capture the white pawn, then white gets this amazing center in addition to the bishop being ready uh, to capture the pawn back. So instead, uh, after this a3 move, in this circumstance, we're going to retreat our bishop back and allow white to go e4, but then say uh, we let white build the center, but now we're going to attack the center thereafter with our pawns. Moving on uh, in this big uh, fourth move uh, alternatives, uh, we're now getting into the main ways of playing. Uh, Bishop d2 has its own chapter, either here on move 4, or actually at this point, it's more popular doing this bishop move on move 5. Either way, both of those alternatives are looked at in a separate bishop to d2 chapter. Speaking of this pawn to e3 move, it is called the Rubenstein variation. Uh, and it leads to many uh, different plans for white. Uh, we are going to castle here, and now white can choose to move the knight in, in front of the king to protect against the trade bishop for knight to give doubled pawns. Uh, the problem with this is that it blocks the bishop on f1, and we're just going to play sensible moves, trying to get our pawns into the center. 
It's also possible to first move the bishop out and then afterwards uh, move the knight in to that e2 square, uh, getting that protection of its body. Uh, once again, uh, we're uh, planning to just have our pawns into the center of the board. And if we're lucky, or rather if white allows us to, we will try to create a position where white has this lone pawn in the center called the isolated queen pawn. This can be good for white, but I aim to prove that very often in these kind of situations, it will be a long-term weakness. The main moves for white uh, instead here is to move the knight up to f3. Uh, and after that, we just push our pawn forward in the center, uh, creating a lot of tension with these pawns looking at each other. Uh, white can trade on d5, after which I suggest going for a position where both players have just one pawn in the center. Uh, the main way of playing for white, though, is just to continue development. And after castles, I'm advocating a trade between the pawns in the center, but now avoiding a position where white would get this isolated queen pawn because I want to avoid white getting that bishop out into a good position. This is the Rubenstein main line, and the way we play, we aim to prove that this bishop on c1 struggles getting into play and then gives black a good position. Uh, let's uh, move back to our fourth move options. And the last major one is queen to c2. Uh, and here, I'm recommending a bit of an unusual move, not in the history of chess, but rather unusual in the this uh, decade. Um, here, almost everyone castles. But when I was young, I learned to go d5, which I think makes a lot of sense because you're putting your pawn in the center of the board. If white tries to attack our bishop, we'll make the trade with the knight. The queen is moving around a lot, and we will continue harassing that queen, moving our knight up to an attack, and then pushing c5, creating that massive tension between the pawns, but also kind of making sure that we're attacking before the white king manages to castle and get into safety. This is a, a very enterprising way of playing, and I'm frankly surprised it fell out of fashion. If white instead, on move five, uh, decides to go for the trade in the center, once again, I'm bringing back some of the good old stuff. Uh, modern players tend to recapture with a pawn, but in the good old days, they took with the queen, which seems a bit weird, getting the queen out early, but we are putting pressure towards this uh, d4 pawn. Uh, and if the knight comes out to protect, then queen f5 offers a queen trade, which is quite favorable for black. Even though black gets doubled pawns, black has great control of the light squares in the center, and this is considered completely acceptable. Instead, queen b3 was the move played by Vichy Anand in his world championship match against Vladimir Kramnik. Uh, but here, I believe that I have found good antidotes against the plan used by Anand in that match, uh, and we will go, of course, very deeply into that in the main course. Needless to say, there is a lot of ground to cover uh, in the Nimso Indian, but to make it easier for you, we have a special chapter called the Quick Starter which just gives you a, a, a brief intro into all the important lines you need to know before getting started playing the Nimso Indian in your games. And then as you play, uh, you'll be able to build on that knowledge uh, with all the intricacies 
of the, the full lines. I hope this introduction to my course has piqued your interest and gotten your credit card ready. You can actually just buy the course now risk free because Chessable has a 30 day money back guaranteed, which means if you don't like the course, you can just ask for your money back within 30 days. Studying this course is not just going to teach you NIMSO, the chess opening. It's also going to teach you so many important pawn structures and other middle game strategies uh, in what I believe to be one of the most diverse and richest openings we have in chess. So I hope I've managed to convince you that this course is something you need. Uh, and I'll see you then. Uh, within the Hammers Nimso Indian. You can study this course on Chessable in three different ways. First, you can read through the digital text, clicking through the variations and reading the annotations the author has written out. Second, you can watch the video walkthroughs where the author plays through the variations on the chessboard and often goes into more depth explaining the nuances and the positions. Finally, you can test yourself on the material with Move Trainer, which uses the science of spaced repetition to ensure you remember the material over the long term. Best of all, you can combine all of these features for maximum effect. That's because Chessable syncs each part of the video lecture to its text and move trainer variation, meaning you can quickly and conveniently watch the video, read through the variation, and quiz yourself on the material all together. One of my favorite things about Chessable is the connection between the author and the student. If you have a question about something, just send a message into the forums and you're going to get an answer. I also really like this feature Chessable has where you can limit how many moves into the game you're going to learn. It's fantastic for lower rated players uh, who just wants to know the essence of the openings, while very advanced players will say, give me everything.